Hello world, it's John Pinto, your roving realtor, Bon Vivant video blogger, podcaster, here with Matt Tryon, nutritionist. And today we're going to talk about is food relevant for the microbiome? Or my question would be, how is food relevant to the microbiome? So please enlighten us, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that we know about the microbiome, the gut microbiome, it's not just the bacteria, but there's there's also viruses and there's fungi. There's all kinds of things happening in our gut microbiome. Now, one of the things we know for sure as a fact is that food can alter the types of microbiome that we have. So, for example, we can this is evident in different kinds of cultures. We know that in Asia, it's very common to not be able to digest milk products, for example. So not having the right bacteria to create the enzymes to help digest milk is just one, one common example of how food or culturally food might impact the microbiome itself. That being said, the American diet is fairly diversified. So when we eat a, a diet specifically, our, a a combination of foods that we like, which is common, what we're doing. I think we talked about this, that Americans like to eat what they what they like to eat. So our microbiome is gonna is is going to adjust according to the way, what we're actually eating, particularly in the amount of species that that were or that are being grown in response to these these kinds of foods that we have. So how do we how do we deal with the Armageddon, uh, the culinary Armageddon of all this fast food and junk food and processed food, you know, how does that fit into the equation? Well, it's unfortunate because when we have, when we're inundated with these, these types of like fast food in general, not a lot of this type of food. It might provide us the proteins and fats and there's even carbohydrates, but there's a lot of sugar in it. One of the issues that the one of the things that the the microbiome needs is things like fiber and and other types of small small uh, molecules that help the bacteria produce molecules that, the body needs, like the immune system. So for example, butyrate is a very important molecule that's produced by the bacteria. If we don't get the kinds of foods that feed the bacteria that produce butyrate, we start getting more inflammation in the body that we see in people who have diabetes, people who have autoimmune diseases, obesity, and it's very, very common. The result of that is that we're not, we start developing not just inflammatory diseases, but we're not really healing the body as effectively as we possibly could. That's one of the reasons the fast food is not really helpful for us. Maybe from a macronutrient dollar per calorie context it is, but it doesn't really help us in the long run. Hmm. Okay. Now that, what'd you call it? Butyrol? Butyrate. Butyrate? Yeah, butyrate. So where, where do you get that good stuff? Butyrate is produced by certain bacteria in the microbiome. And there's a number of species that produce butyrate. Fiber is one of the things that feeds this, these bacteria that produce butyrate. Now butyrate, what it does is it goes to the immune system or it reduces or produce, helps produce something called these regulatory T cells. Regulatory T cells that are part of the immune system that help regulate other cells and keep them from being uh, overactive. So it reduces inflammation. It reduces the activity of the immune system when it doesn't need to be active. Butyrate also helps keep the micro, the, say the mucosal layer or butyrate kind of helps also the, reduce the, helps the mucosal layer of the microbiome or the, uh, the gut at an optimal level. There's actually a thin layer between the bacteria in our in our gut and the the uh, the bloodstream and the rest of the body. It's actually the only sterile part of the body where there is no bacteria. 
And so when you keep that mucin layer, that mucosal layer uh, clean and have a lot, make sure it has a lot of integrity, then we're not going to have the IBS. We're not going to have a lot of gut issues. But it needs, it needs the, the molecules that are produced by the bacteria to make it, make it sound and have like a lot of integrity. The other thing that it does also is that it keeps the immune system in check by reducing the amount of signal molecules that go out to these immune systems to raise inflammation. Okay, so what would be some foods that would be universally uh, good to eat to uh, raise those levels and what foods would be universally bad to avoid lowering or eliminating those levels? So in general, what I what I recommend, even if you had a good gut or even if you had a bad gut, there's a few things that actually really help with these bacteria that produce butyrate. One is potato starch. Potato starch contains resistant starch, which is food for the bacteria, particularly the ones that produce butyrate. And you can actually get a bag of this. It's just, it's really cheap to get. Can you get potato potato starch and potatoes? You can. So here's the issue with that, though. (laughs) You can. You can, but here's the issue with that. I know where you're going with this. You want French fries. You're like, can I get this out of French fries? No, you can't get it out of French fries. The issue is that when you cook a potato, when it becomes hot, you don't get the resistant starch. You actually have to put it back into a refrigerator and let it cool down again to have the content of to get the resistant starch back into that, into that potato. Now, how many of us like eating cold fries? How many of us like eating a cold baked potato? I don't know. You can do it that way. I just think a, t- you know, a tablespoon of potato starch is a lot easier. Mm-hmm. So that's one way to do it. Is that a supplement? It is a supplement. Well, it's not really a supplement. I guess that people use the potato starch in baking a lot, but you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on anything. All right, so let me ask you a simple question. All right, I like to make frittatas. Okay. And I like to uh, roast potatoes. I li- like to slice them or cube them, uh, toss them with a little olive oil, salt, and oregano. That sounds really good. Yeah. And then uh, I'll throw them in a pan, season some eggs, uh, whisk the eggs, put a little water in it to fluff them up a little bit. I'll, uh, um, I'll put it on low heat in a pan, and then I'll finish it under the broiler because... I'm not into flipping the frittata. <laughs> okay. Now, you could eat, actually eat that cold. Would that get it? Would that do it? That would do it. If you could eat it cold? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Be I got some potatoes on my countertop right now. Yeah, well, so what, what, what time should I be over? Really <laughs> it's going to take me a while to make the frittata. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so this is interesting. So... Um, what advice would you uh, leave our listeners with on this subject? When we eat food, if there's one thing that I could say, and this has actually changed the way that I eat. I, I eat to, to live, not live to eat. When I make a food choice, it really is, I'm asking myself, well, how is it impacting my gut microbiome? Because ultimately that is what my what covers my health and my health is really my livelihood Mm -hmm. so that's really the the biggest advice i could really ask to tell is to to ask yourself how is this impacting well um i was recently talking to david gates at the the bistro at inglenook and uh, Mm -hmm. francis ford coppola had gone to um duke university with some special nutrition program Mm -hmm. And he said, I love certain foods, but they didn't love me back. <laughs> yeah, join the club. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, very good. Well, now we have an, a clue as to how uh, microbiome interfaces with the diet. And we'll do a deeper dive on this on our next episode. Uh, thank you, Matt Tryon, for filling us in. And thank you viewers for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next video blog. Bye.